Thank you, Lisa, for providing a good overview of the Global Filer Express chemistry. To begin, I'd like to give a brief introduction of the rapid hit system. As you can see from this next slide, the instrument integrates the processes that are commonly performed at the bench today, starting with DNA extraction, PCR amplification, electrophoresis, and data analysis. So essentially, an operator can insert a sample and obtain a profile out within two hours. The rapid hit system is a self-contained, fully integrated instrument and can therefore be implemented anywhere. The user interface is quite simple and requires minimal training for an operator to be self-sufficient. After forensic review, a code of CMF file can be generated to query databases. The instrument is very simple to use. It has four consumable reagents, an anode polymer cartridge, a buffer cartridge, and two sample cartridges. A simply simple GUI interface guides the operator through each step. We have three chemistries available for the system, ranging from a four dye chemistry to a six dye chemistry. PowerPlex 16 contains 16 genetic markers and can run up to five samples and is provided by Promega. The Global Filer Express is a six dye chemistry and NGM Select Express is a five dye chemistry provided by Life Technologies. As Lisa has already mentioned, the Global Filer Express contains 24 markers and in this cartridge configuration, the user can run from one to seven samples. The Global Filer Express kit chemistry are the same ratios on the cartridges as recommended by Life Technologies for a final 20 microliter PCR reaction. The NGM Select Express has 17 genetic markers. It's a five dye system and can also run one through seven samples. And this kit has been approved for upload to the UK database. This next slide is showing a high list, level list of the studies that we performed for our developmental validation of Global Filer Express on the Rapid Hit system, according to the SWIGDAM guidelines. More detail for each study will be provided throughout the presentation. A large portion of the data will be displayed as a box and whisker plot. We like to use this format because it's easy to visualize differences in the distribution of the data. So as you can see in this slide, the box plot shows the 25th and 75th percentile and the median and the min and max data points for all results. This next slide is showing you the profile we have obtained for the control DNA 007 on the rapid hit system. I think the profile looks very similar to data off of a 3130 Excel or a 3500 system. We use the positive control DNA 007 to assess reproducibility of the rapid hit systems. We wanted to look at a consistent DNA input to assess the reproducibility of detection and PCR amplification. We ran four positive controls on each instrument. The left-hand graph is a box plot with the peak heights of the four controls on each instrument. And the right graph is a box plot of the heterozygote peak height ratios. As you can see, the distribution of the data is fairly uniform across each instrument. We also calculated the intracolor color balance, which isn't shown on this slide, but the maximum differences between all of the samples was 
between 5 and 14 percent. This next slide shows the details of our DNA extraction validation studies. We modified two extraction parameters, the B concentration and the B incubation time. The red text indicates our optimized condition. The lysis volume is set at 500 microliters to ensure complete coverage of the swabs. To minimize the variables, we developed control swabs to use for most of our validation studies. We obtained the cell line HTB157 from ATCC, and this is the same cell line as component F that is contained in the NIST standard reference material 2391. We designated this control swab as a thousand M. To produce these swabs, we pipetted different cell loads onto a cotton swab and air dry them overnight. For the extraction experiment, we use control swabs loaded with either 25,000 cells or 200,000 cells. Three replicates for each condition was tested, and we calculated the average peak heights for each parameter. We chose average peak height as a variable to indicate higher or lower DNA being recovered. In this next slide, we are showing you the results from our bead concentration experiment. The top graph is showing you the average peak height plus or minus the standard deviation at each bead concentration for the different cell loads. As one would expect, when you have lower bead concentration, you have less DNA being recovered and would expect a lower peak height. With increasing DNA bead concentration, our average peak height did not significantly increase with the high cell load at 200,000. We do see a slight increase in peak heights with the lower cell load, but the difference at 2x bead concentration was not significantly different than our optimized condition of 1x. The lower graph is showing another way to view the data, which is the box plot of the peak heights for the 25,000 or the 200,000 cell load at the different B concentrations. This next slide is showing the results from our bead incubation time. Again, the top graph is the average peak heights plus or minus the standard deviation at each bead incubation time for the two cell loads. Again, as we can see, when you decrease the incubation time of the lysis buffer with the beads, you would expect a little bit lower average peak height. Increasing the bead incubation time did not result in increasing average peak heights. We do see a slight decrease in peak heights at the higher cell load. Again, the box plot of the peak heights for each of the conditions are shown below. The standard condition is indicated by the red text. 